Hello, Internet. My name is Daniel O'Brien, though I'm also warming up to Dini Obini, and welcome to another oddly charming episode of Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder, the show where I talk so fast that I'm told it makes our viewers actually uncomfortable. Today's episode cautiously optimistically investigates a phenomenon with no pre existing nomenclature, so we'll have to explicitly say it's called. Here's the thing about me. I rewatch movies and TV shows a lot. Sometimes I do it to see what I missed the first or second time around, but mostly I do it because as much as I love watching new movies, there's a nice comfort in indulging in the familiar and sitting down to consume something that I already know I love. I treat movies like songs in this way. You don't re-listen to the same song to be surprised by it or experience it for the first time again. You do it because you know you like it and it'll make you feel good or pump you up or whatever. Unfortunately, re-watching the same movies over and over again has resulted in me getting bored with the actual protagonist, forcing me to care about minor and side characters and sometimes characters I've never even seen, like Abe Froman, the Sausage King of Chicago, a guy who is so big and famous that the snooty or snotty host at an exclusive restaurant says his name Hello. and title with awed reverence. But he's not so big and famous that said host even knows what he looks like. You're Abe Froman. That's right. I'm Abe Froman, the Sausage King of Chicago. What's Abe Froman's deal? What's that guy's deal? Where's his movie? Why do we spend a whole movie on some 17 year old's day instead of figuring out what makes the majestic and elusive and benevolent Meat King tick? Anyway, I buried Abe Sausage King of Chicago in the intro because I didn't have enough material to talk about him in a full entry. Like, I, I'm done of, of him now. So let's, what's our first entry? Can we just, who are the characters that I desperately need to know more about? There are a lot of really cool experts in Ghostbusters. The Busters themselves are scientists who happen to be friends who are also professional Ghostbusters, and also they're very funny. Sigourney Weaver's Dana is smart and capable and an expert musician. Slimer is the Slimerius. Lots of accomplished and cool people to occupy your attention. And yet, I want a movie about Rick Moranis' Lewis Tully. If you only have a dim memory of Ghostbusters, you remember Lewis as the squirrely, nerdy guy who eventually becomes a dog monster, but otherwise has very little impact on the first movie. And in the second movie, decides he's a Ghostbuster, but again, has very little impact on the main plot and mostly serves as empty comic relief, like, hey, look at the nerd. If you've got an okay memory, you remember that he's an accountant and an outspoken fitness nut. I was just exercising. I taped 20 minute workout on my machine and played it back at high speed so it only took 10 minutes, I got a great workout. And if you have a crazy specific memory, perhaps you remember what a good climber he is. That's strange, I didn't realize I left it on. Oh yeah, you know what I did? I climbed on the ledge and tried to disconnect the cable but I couldn't get in so you know what I did? I turned up my TV real loud too so everyone would think that Bye, both Alice. our TVs had something wrong with them. But I'm insane, so I remember everything and I think about all of those things plus this. Here is Lewis outlining the agenda of a party he's throwing to Dana. That's great, I'll tell everybody you're coming. We're gonna play Twister. We're gonna do some break dancing. Here. That party sounds like a goddamn blast. Lewis is an accountant, and this party is comprised almost exclusively of his clients, a move that he made so he could write the entire party off as a business expense. I'm giving this whole thing as a promotional expense. That's why I invited clients instead of friends. That's canny. And you'd think it would be a dry affair because it's a bunch of clients who don't know each other, but no. It has twister and break dancing, which let's not dance around this. This means this is a f party. Twister and breakdancing are two out of the only three things people can do on a concentrated and isolated rectangular surface. And the third is f***ing. You twist your body to breakdance on a rectangle of cardboard. You twist your body to twister on a square twister pad. And you etc. your body to have sex on a rectangular bed. And those are the things. If you think Lewis is throwing a twister and breakdance party to not invite the idea of showing off the flexibility and mobility of our bodies to have sex, then I'm sorry, but you're living in a fantasy world. Or you're nine. In which case, please don't watch this show. I say f a lot. And I don't think nine year olds need to, to hear me say f But f Hey, here's another thing about Lewis that gets forgotten because most of this movie is about Bill Murray and ghosts and busting. His f party is full of mostly stuffy but clearly down clients. And this person. Lewis. I'm going home. Don't leave yet. Who is this woman? Lewis threw this party, yes, as a business tax write-off, but mostly to woo Dana, with whom he's in love. Meanwhile, there's this goddamn full-blown 80s smoke show that clearly came to this party for Lewis. This bombshell is ready to leave, and Lewis gets her to stay by reluctantly dancing poorly with her, and she loves it! Listen, maybe if we start dancing, other people will join in. Okay. What is anything? This is why I need a standalone Lewis movie. This accountant slash fitness nut slash reluctant stud slash expert climber slash break dancer is the most interesting part of a movie where ghosts are real and can fillet Dan Aykroyd, and yet he's banished to the sidelines. In every interaction Lewis has with every other character, he's never quite connecting because it seems like his mind is racing a mile a minute. Teach me, Lewis, what is your level? 
The Breakfast Club has such a small cast, and it's so focused, and everyone gets to spend a lot of time talking about their deal. So you mostly get what everyone is about. Even the principal. You get a fairly complete picture of him. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. But, boy, I'd give some amount of money for a spinoff featuring that weird janitor. I look through your letters. Look through your lockers. I listen to your conversations. You don't know that, but I do. I am the eyes and ears of this institution, my friends. Holy shit, I want to read this guy's memoirs. In eight years, he's learned more about this student body than all of its teachers and administrators combined. He's been silently observing everyone, and I want to know A, what you learned, and B, what your life is like that you are choosing to spend your time learning the secrets of high school students. This isn't prison where you can trade information for protection or more secrets. You can't flip high school secrets for literally anything. So what is your end game, buddy? You read Ali Sheedy's notes? What'd you learn? Mostly high school stuff? Cool. Why is that important to you? Please answer in the form of a movie on my desk by tomorrow. Anyway, do we have another... Sid No Last Name Given is the sad antagonist of the first Toy Story movie. He's a kid who destroys toys before he knows that toys are real. Then he finds out that toys are real, becoming, as far as we can tell, the first human being to do so. He spent a life with a shit family and occupied his time rebuilding and then blowing up toys to express his emotions and creativity. And then one day, toys are like, we're real. S stop that and don't tell anyone. No one will believe you. Play nice. So play nice. That's act one. Act three is Toy Story 3, where Sid is working as a garbage man. So, what is act two? It would be easy to say, ha, Sid was bad as a kid and now he has a bad job. Justice, ha! And yet, Sid is happy. And being a garbage man is a good job. We know it's a good job because we've interviewed garbage men for Cracked. But even if we hadn't, we'd still know it was a good job. We would accept that it was good because Sid was happy. Not just happy, but actively dancing and drumming at his job. A job at up which America's elite would turn their noses. So. What conclusions can we draw? Here's the information we have. One, Sid in the past had a rough home life when he was a kid. Two, Sid in the past learned toys were real and could talk and rotate their heads like monsters. An undeniably traumatic affair. Three, Sid in the present is careless and at peace. What the f happened to Sid between Toy Story 1 and 3? Learning that toys are alive should destroy anyone. Even the hypothetical idea of that being present in someone's life should impact it. But Sid learned it firsthand, for real, from toys. They're real and they're mad at you, and you're the only one who knows it. He managed to absorb and process this and still live a normal and positive life. Did he become a crazy person on the news spouting about how toys were real? No. Did he become a drug addict? No. Did he commit suicide? No. He did a thankless job that most Americans don't even think about, and he did it while dancing. What happened? What happened in between Toy Stories 1 and 3 that turned Sid from a sadistic monster with sole knowledge of toy magic to a zen-like appreciator of everything? The answer to that question would have been monumentally better than Toy Story 2. And also, hey, I think we can learn a lot from Sid. Anyway, uh, that's it for this month's obsessive parp cult parp this up pop. It's uh, shorter than normal, but that's like that's by design. Uh, this will come out in December, and that's uh, Christmas time. You should spend that time with your family. So I'm intentionally giving you less of of all good old Dini Obini. That's all done to encourage you to spend time with your family and not me. Join us next month when our topic will be. Why did Slimer become so iconic? Oh, man, that is a good question. He was just one of the many ghosts in the first Ghostbuster movie, and he persisted. He somehow became synonymous with the Ghostbuster brand. He was in the cartoon show as like a uh, like a cool ghost character that the rest of the Ghostbusters accepted. They were like, we bust ghosts, but not this one. He's our buddy. They made juice boxes about him, but I, I don't know what he brought to the table. Why did America love Slimer? That's weird as shit. I almost wish uh, this show would pursue the episode concepts we talk about at the end of the episodes, but... And I know we won't. Like, historically, we haven't. Every time an episode ends with, next time we'll talk about blah, 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 it's always a bit. We never follow up on those. But this, this Slimer thing, that'd be an okay concept. Anyway, bet we won't explore it. Bye. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Make sure you slime and subslime in the in the comments. I'm still really hung up on this on this Slimer thing, and I know we're not gonna do an episode about it, so this is my last opportunity to talk to anyone about it. A of our director thinks it's about the hot dogs that he eats, the hot dogs in America. He's like holding, he's like holding up a mirror to America that is like, you, don't you love hot dogs? And America's like, I do, and I see myself in you, Slimer. Um, in the Lady Ghostbusters, he gets a Lady Slimer. That's interesting. Anyway, make sure you slime.